Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to 108 Harley Street CPD Snippets. Uh, my name is Fiona McNeil. I'm one of the consultant breast surgeons here at 108 Harley Street. And I'm going to talk to you about mastitis or breast infections. Clearly, the majority of work that we deal with as breast surgeons is diagnostics and breast cancer and breast cancer surgery. But a small but significant part of our workload is to do with breast infections. And this can be a very complex area, so I hope you find this of interest. So breast infections account for between 5 to 8 percent of NHS breast clinic activity um, and about 3,000 admissions each year for surgery. Now, of course, if a patient needs to be admitted for surgery, usually that's going to be surgical drainage for an abscess. It really means that we've not been able to manage their breast infections um, more conservatively. And I hope that uh, I can give you some guidance on how we can all improve on this. So it's fairly straightforward to classify breast infections or mastitis into lactational and non-lactational. Clearly lactational means that you've got a new mum who's lactating. Non-lactational can sometimes be the more complex and more difficult to treat. And I tend to view those as infections that are in the central part of the breast around about the nipple areola complex behind it or around it. And this is often termed periductal mastitis. And then you've got the more peripheral infections which tend to lie outside the nipple areola complex area. And there can be a myriad of different reasons for these more peripheral types of mastitis or breast infections. But the one that we might just talk a little bit about is granulomatous mastitis, mainly because like periductal mastitis, this has a complex etiology and can be difficult to treat. Underlying all of this, however, is inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is not mastitis, but it mimics mastitis. And this is the worry for all of us. Are we missing an inflammatory breast cancer? So we have lactational infections and we have non-lactational infections. But we also have, lurking in the background, inflammatory breast cancer, which can mimic any of these. So for lactational mastitis or purple mastitis, clearly the woman is going to be, uh, is going to be lactating. And the underlying cause is thought to be milk stasis, which then leads to inflammation, which may then lead to infection, um, even an abscess, even breast gangrene and generalised sepsis requiring admission. The cause of the infection is probably related to nipple trauma from breastfeeding or poor nipple or breast hygiene during breastfeeding or poor breastfeeding techniques or poor uh, regimens. And it can, of course, be bilateral. Um, you'll all be very familiar with lactational mastitis much more than myself because I tend to see the more end stage lactational mastitis, which is referred to the breast clinic often for drainage. But it starts with this inflammatory process, which is often mild and moderate and localised in one quadrant and associated with redness. And it can then proceed on to infection with the classic fever and flu-like symptoms sometimes associated with nausea and a general feeling of being unwell. It can lead to sepsis, uh, which can require admission for intravenous antibiotics. And then, of course, abscess. And this is all the usual signs of abscess. You've got a fluctuant mass that is pointing and the patient can often be quite unwell. And you do occasionally see overlying skin gangrene with a breast abscess. So how do we treat lactational mastitis? Well, in the first instance, it's normally supportive. So this is massage, uh, massage towards the nipple to try and drain out the uh, milk stasis and good nipple care. Um, this is often going to involve uh, careful washing and the use of Vaseline. And cold cabbage leaves are surprisingly good. And I've given you a picture here of the cabbage that you can ask your patients to put in the fridge and you can see that these cabbage leaves 
if you take each leaf off and put it into the freezer or the fridge and it's nice and cold, it fits very snugly around the red, hot and painful breast and provides a lovely cooling compress. And my patients tell me this is a very simple but effective remedy. The other thing is to ask the patient to continue breastfeeding. The infection in the breast is not going to affect the baby. And if they can't breastfeed because the nipples are too damaged or it's too painful, then pumping every two hours to try and get the milk flowing. If supportive measures don't work, consider antibiotics or consider antibiotics if the patient is unwell and have local cellulitis. Now, the infecting organism is usually staph and it's usually staph aureus. I would usually go for augmenting or flucloxacillin. And for the first 24 hours, I would go for a double dose, um, despite all of the recommendations for NICE. And I normally would prescribe 1.2 grams of augmentin or a gram of flucloxacillin for 24 hours. This may give your patient diarrhea. Do probiotics help? I think the jury's out with regards to probiotics, but I would recommend um, that they use VSL3 because some patients do find this helpful. And in total, I give a five day course of antibiotics. The first 24 hours high dose and then the next four days standard dose. But if you're worried or concerned about your patient, then refer them to your local breast clinic for investigation, ultrasound, plus or minus aspiration of any abscess. Nowadays, we try very hard to avoid surgical drainage and we can normally do drainage and wash out under ultrasound control. And sometimes this has to be daily. And so the patients need to have access to a rapid diagnostic clinic. You'll find that most local NHS units will offer a rapid diagnostic service within the same day or 24 hours. Um, but of course, we can offer that here as well at 108 Harley Street between Mondays to Fridays. Um, and of course, uh, admission is last resort. Now, coming on to non lactational mastitis, as I described, this is normally central subareola or periductal mastitis. This is a very poorly understood condition. We don't understand the etiology, but it's probably complex and multifactorial. And once again, it's going to be due to secretion stasis rather than milk stasis, because of course women do get natural secretions in the major duct or milk system, particularly those who've breastfed in the past. And the secretions uh, accumulate because of damaged and scarred milk ducts. Once again, this same process of inflammation and infection and abscess formation. And this is a vicious cycle because then this causes more damage, more scarring, and then they get more infections. Such patients are usually smokers, and we think this is related to the nicotine, nicotine and uh, other products within the cigarettes themselves. They're often premenopausal, and they tend to be, in my clinical experience, in their 30s. And presumably, this is because of smoking for over 10, 15 years, causing this chronic periductal or major duct damage. There are other causes, uh, possibly inflammatory conditions, um, such as hydradenitis, perhaps with underlying autoimmune um, problems. There can, of course, be underlying structural problems from patients, for example, who've had nipple piercing. Um, this is a chronic and relapsing condition. It's very troublesome to the patients and very distressing, and it can lead to chronic fistula and sinuses. So how do we manage this periductal mastitis? Well, my advice is to consider an early breast and skin clinic involvement to try and prevent some of these chronic problems. And here at 108, um, we do very much have a multidisciplinary approach to these patients with our dermatologists. And you see this as an acute problem, as a relapsing problem. The acute problem, once again, this vicious cycle of inflammation, infection and abscess formation stop smoking. But of course, the damage may have already been done. It may be too late but I still encourage the patients to stop smoking. And the infection is slightly different from the lactational patients. Once again, the primary infecting organism is usually staph, but you can also see, particularly when you start getting relapsing problems, enterococci and anaerobes such as bacteroides and streptococcus. And so you may need to consider broader spectrum antibiotics, the penicillins plus metronidazole. 
Um, and once again, if the patient has an abscess, then they absolutely need to be referred to the breast clinic for drainage, hopefully ultrasound. But occasionally for these patients, they're more likely to need extensive surgical drainage and breast repair. Now, the relapsing patients need long term support and continuity of care within primary care and secondary care, and they need to have their expectations managed because this is a problem that will continue potentially for many years. Uh, they may need to have long term antibiotics and the antibiotics that we use in conjunction with our dermatologists here, alinocycline and uh, tetracycline and antibacterial skin washes and we may need to use these for up to three to six months. Interestingly, this condition clearly has some hormonal influence because it usually resolves after the menopause. I do have patients who have required double mastectomy for this very disabling condition. Um, once you remove the breast and the major duct system and the skin involved with the chronic fistulae and um, sinuses, it does settle down. But the patients by this stage are usually very traumatised and need a lot of psychological support. So we do everything we can to try and avoid surgery for such patients. But this can be the long term consequence of severe um, relapsing periductal mastitis. Um, the peripheral infections um, associated with non lactational mastitis is mainly granulomatous mastitis. Once again, this is a very poorly understood condition. It has a complex etiology, once again, probably multifactorial. But we think that this is different from periductal mastitis is rather than being as a result of some underlying structural problems within the major duct system itself. We think that this may be a microorganism that's infecting the breast. This has not yet been identified and it'll be interesting to see over the next decade how we do identify this. Some sort of bacteria, perhaps similar to helicobacteria causing problems. Um, with ulcers and chronic reflux. The important thing for granulomatous mastitis is that you must avoid surgery at all costs because surgery makes this condition much worse. These patients can sometimes benefit from a short course of high dose uh, and um, rapidly de-escalating uh, corticosteroid therapy. And some patients with severe and resistant granulomatous mastitis can respond to anti-TNF drugs, suggesting that there may be an autoimmune component to this, because we do see this with other autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Diabet diabetic mastopathy is an interesting one. It tends to give a very typical appearance of cellulitis with numerous breast lumps that can mimic breast cancer and often requires a, a biopsy to make the diagnosis. So there are other causes of mastitis and I put mastitis in inverted commas here. So for example, previous breast cancer surgery and radiotherapy can give uh, lymphangitis Breast implants, this is normally due to chronic infection around the implant causing capsulitis, and this is normally within the first year of surgery. Eczema or skin conditions with secondary infections can give uh, mastitis, and also nicks in the skin from plucking or shaving chest hairs. And here you can see I've given you a picture of a man, and men can also get breast uh, mastitis. And nipple piercing, I've already mentioned, causing structural problems with the major duct system. And these are normally simply treated with either topical or systemic antibiotics. Um, patients who have infected breast implants uh, would normally need to see their implanting surgeon for further investigations. And clearly patients who present with mastitis after a diagnosis of breast cancer and radiotherapy need to be seen in their local breast cancer unit. And of course, the one thing that we all fear, inflammatory breast cancer. Now, inflammatory breast cancer is not mastitis, but it does mimic mastitis. Generally, the patients are not lactating and they're usually over 40 years. However, the patients in whom we misdiagnose or make late diagnoses are usually the ones who are under 40 and who are lactating. And of course, such women often present to the A&E departments and they may be managed with multiple course of antibiotics and they may be managed by um, 
uh, non-specialist team who are just not familiar with the diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer. And I think it's very fair to put this in red. Inflammatory breast cancer is difficult to clinically distinguish from mastitis. And sometimes when I see a young woman with a really good going uh, lactational mastitis, I'm often concerned that there could be an underlying inflammatory component because they're almost impossible to tell apart. And I'll keep a very close eye on such a patient. And just some pictures. Here is the classic picture of mastitis with the periareolar peri redness extending it to the inner quadrant in this patient. Here is a patient of periductal mastitis and here you can see a periductal fistula. Um, you can see that there's not a huge difference between a periductal mastitis photograph and a lactational mastitis, it's often the age and the history and the fact in periductal mastitis they're not lactating. Now here is a more typical picture of a granulomatous mastitis and you can see the more peripheral, present, peripheral presentation and you can see this patient here has a little bit of overlying skin gangrene but you can see the multiple abscesses all lying peripherally and here you can see the granuloma under uh, the microscope. And of course, this could be mimicked, uh, this could be mistaken for breast cancer, and such patients normally end up having a biopsy. And the biopsy itself can then generate this type of suppurating, oozing type of wound. And what you must do is avoid the temptation of operating on this, because the patient will then end up with an even bigger suppurating wound. And here you can see an incipient a uh, granulomatous lesion just about ready to erupt through the soft tissue. Here, of course, we've got inflammatory breast cancer with the periareola um, redness. Um, I challenge you to really see the difference between this and this. They can look absolutely identical. So always think about inflammatory breast cancer. So the key points in, lactation, in, in mastitis is it's most commonly lactational and normally supportive treatment or a short course of flucloxacillin or augmentin usually suffices and the patients normally get better very quickly. If the patient's not lactating, it's likely to be periductal mastitis or less commonly granulomatous mastitis. And for these patients, I'd always consider an early clinic referral for multidisciplinary management. And thirdly, if the patient's not lactating, they're over 40, they've got a lump, or their mastitis doesn't settle with simple supportive care and antibiotics, always think about inflammatory breast cancer. Could this be inflammatory breast cancer? And consider an early breast clinic referral for management and investigation. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed the 108 uh, CPD snippets on breast mastitis. Uh, I welcome any questions um, either now or please do feedback if you would like to ask any questions. Thank you very much.